Hi, I'm Isabel. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today at Bar TV for this interview. We're so excited to have you. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for uh, letting me have this opportunity to talk to you and all to your, to your audience. All right, let's get started. So how long have you been a judge before retiring in 2018? So I had been a judge for nine years until I retired in 2018. Um, uh, it is mandatory state, uh, state law that all judges have to retire at 70 years old. Oh, wow, didn't know that one. Um, so how can one become a judge? Um, what's the process or the requirements? So there's a minimum uh, requirement of uh, at least 10 years of uh, um, being a lawyer, and then he or she uh, makes out an application, files it with uh, this uh, body called the Judicial Nominating Commission, and the members of that commission are appointed by the governor of the state. So what inspired you to become a judge? What inspired me to become a judge was not that um, I, I strived to be a judge at the very beginning, mm -hmm. but as uh, I progressed in um, practice law, many people talked to me about that uh, I should perhaps think about becoming a judge. So for uh, some judges that I appeared before, uh, they uh, talked to me on, uh, on the side and, and suggested I apply. I have fellow colleagues who also suggested and who had also applied and mm -hmm. became judges. So they were your role models? Um, essentially so. Did you have any role models growing up? I think the role model, I, 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 think, I think about my life at this point in time, probably mm -hmm. my mother. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she took risks. Mm -hmm. uh, to come from China to here, uh, to know the language, adapted to United States culture, uh, raised four children, mm -hmm. right? And then finally got all her whole family here uh, from China to the United States. And she had what, they had a, a family of uh, seven siblings wow. and, uh, and also her father. So mm -hmm. um, during that process, yeah. I, I helped her do all of that as a child, mm -hmm. not as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So I, I just had this sense of, of helping yeah. and, and being an advocate. So you were put into that like position at a very young age? Very young age. Yeah. So did race ever seem to affect your journey or experience in the judicial system? If so, how? I don't think per se uh, that uh, race is... is um, something that I, I, I think about it in, in, from my day to day when I was a judge, although I, I did encounter it, and when I encountered it, I, I would confront it. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe that it does play a role like prominently nowadays? Have you ever seen it around you in the workplace? Um, I think most if there is racism, right, um, is more implicit and being that people don't think about what they're saying and what they may be doing uh, that may have an a, a impact on people of color. However, sometimes there is out, outright racism. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can give you an instance. Uh, when I was sitting as a judge, I was hearing a um, a criminal case, and it was a, a, a white woman uh, who was the lawyer representing the defendant, and she was arguing her, her uh, the merits of her case, and I, I disagree with her, and I told her I disagree with her. Uh, she started to speak to me with the same arguments, but very slow, as if because I'm mm -hmm. Asian. I didn't understand the English language. I called her out on it. Yeah. I, th I, I told her that I understood English. She didn't need to speak so slowly that I understood the English language. And I, I basically called her a racist on the mm -hmm. record in front of the whole audience because that's uncalled for. Yeah. Um, what would you say are some of the most important attributes of, as a judge? Um, like what values are important to you? The, the values, mm -hmm. the first thing is the yeah. ability to listen. If, if a judge doesn't listen to anybody, 
the judge doesn't know anything about the case. And then the next thing is the judge has to be fair to both sides, has to be impartial. The judge has to have a really good temperament. That means that the judge can't be going up or going down, but just be moderate. Because that affects the process on how people look at the process, right? Yeah. You know, each litigant, when he or she has that experience in court, right, they, they want to be able to leave and say, I've received justice today from the court. Mm -hmm. So if the judge doesn't enhance that, right, the judge hasn't done his or her job. And obviously the last thing is that the judge has to know the law yeah. and apply the law. I mean, those are the important attributes. Do you ever find it difficult to be impartial or unbiased? I think after a while, as a lawyer, um, most lawyers are able to know that there's always two sides to an argument. Mm -hmm. So if there's two sides of an argument, then as, as a judge who's sitting there with those responsibilities mm -hmm. that I just, and attributes that I just laid out, you know, have to be fair and impartial, you know, he or she is listening to both sides, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and being able to judge the merits of both sides and then applying the law, right, to whatever side is is right. So it shouldn't be difficult. It should mm -hmm. not be difficult. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it should not be difficult if, if the judge is a good judge. Mm -hmm. And I recall that you were um, a mediator at one time. Is that similar to what a judge does? So a mediator, it, you know, meets in private with parties mm -hmm. and try to to mediate people's differences. When I say mediate, meaning try to draw what they want, each party wants, right, and see where the parties can meet in the middle some someplace, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a, and the mediator assists the parties or facilitates the party to get to an agreement where they could both live with. So the mediator doesn't impose any agreement mm -hmm. on the two parties, right? So that's the difference between a mediator and a judge. A judge can can do that sometimes. So I've I've done that from time to time in court where I speak to both parties and see if uh, they can meet in the middle. But in the final analysis, right, the judge can impose a judgment on one side if one side doesn't agree. Well, a mediator can't do that. Right. So um, you also worked in the AOU, the Asian Outreach Center at GBLS. Um, what was your role? Can you tell me more about that? So uh, the uh, Asian Outreach uh, Center is a unit of uh, the Greater Boston Legal Services. And Greater Boston Legal Services is a, a not-for-profit organization in Boston that uh, serves uh, indigent uh, clients in, on the civil side of the law. Mm -hmm. So if, if a uh, person who's poor has a issue with um, consumer issue, uh, something about uh, public assistance or government benefits or a landlord and tenant and he or she can't afford a lawyer, then that person can go to Greater Boston Legal Services and seek legal help. So in the past, <coughs> legal services has, has been around for a long time. It's, um, um, in the past, uh, Greater Boston Legal Services didn't have uh, a bilingual staff whether or not it's lawyers or uh, uh, paralegals. So back in 1972, when uh, I was interning uh, at Greater Boston Legal Services, there was a couple other um, Asian lawyers who were also interning. And we were not serving the Chinatown community, also, although Greater Boston Legal Services should have been. So we started the Asian Outreach Office in Chinatown in 1972. So after uh, we had left as interns, others carried forward. Mm -hmm. So now it's, it's a full-fledged unit, you know, consisting of uh, two lawyers, uh, several paralegals, and also they have interns. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been around for 50 years now. So I've gone back now to volunteer for mm -hmm. them since my retirement. So I'm, I'm what they call the oldest intern there. <laughs> yeah. It's very impressive. So, um, because you mentioned that not many um, 
Asian clients who are there can afford a lawyer, do you think it's important for there to be more bilingual or Asian American um, lawyers and um, I guess workers in general in the judicial system? Yes, definitely. So not only bilingual, but bicultural. I, mm -hmm. I think that in order for uh, effective representation, the lawyer needs to understand the person, obviously, which is through language, to com through communication, but also culturally, because uh, er every every culture has it's a little different. Mm -hmm. And in order for the lawyer to really effectively, from my viewpoint, effectively represent that person, he or she has to understand that person and he, his or her legal needs and why he or she wants what they want. Definitely. Um, you were also the first assistant district attorney in Suffolk County. Um, what does that mean to you? Um, what was your role as um, this was in the Suffolk County uh, District Attorney's Office in Boston, and, and uh, it was during a, uh, an era where, where uh, Boston politics, uh, and in, including the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, had a, a, a lot of Irish American. And uh, the Suffolk uh, DA's office was, was, at that point in time, uh, elected by Newman Flanagan. And um, I had heard um, that uh, he may not have favored uh, um, people other than uh, mm -hmm. Irish Americans. Uh, I had a friend uh, who, who, who I went to high school with, and he was already working there. And as I uh, talked to him, and um, he encouraged me to apply to be uh, an uh, assistant district attorney just like he did. Mm -hmm. So I did, and I got the job. Um, I didn't realize I was the first. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, you know, when, when I've gone through you know, certain steps in my career, I don't think about being the first. I just thought, thought about that would be an interest, interesting job. Uh, prior to that, I had been a lawyer for several years. I really hadn't tried any jury cases. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've tried, basically, I, I did civil cases. So, in civil cases, not many, not that many civil cases go to trial. Right. So, when I became uh, assistant district attorney, you know, uh, that person uh, represents the Commonwealth, the state mm -hmm. of Massachusetts. So, and uh, being the first is just letting the court system get used to that. You know, Asian Americans can appear in court. They can advocate on behalf of the state right. and, and do a good job. So mm -hmm. uh, I did that for five years. It was, it was a very enjoyable job. I'm sure you certainly won't be the last as well. No, there's, there's many, many uh, Asian Americans who, who are in different uh, DA's office mm -hmm. th throughout the Commonwealth and also as, as uh, prosecutors in the federal system being the United States Attorney's Office. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2009, you had a greater honor and privilege of being appointed Associate Justice of the Quincy District Court. Um, what were your responsibilities there? Do you have any interesting stories? So in the, in, in the District Court, it, um, it's called the Gateway to, to Justice. That, mm -hmm. and, and the reason the District Court uh, calls itself the Gateway to Justice is that most common people, that's their contact with the judicial system. Mm -hmm. So, say, if somebody had a, um, a traffic violation, say for a speeding ticket, mm -hmm. and, the per and, and, the, and the driver doesn't agree that the police officer should have cited uh, the driver for mm -hmm. speeding. So, he, the, the driver files an appeal with the district court, and the judge gets to hear that. Mm -hmm. If someone wants to, a landlord wants to evict a tenant, that comes into the district court. Or a tenant has a problem with a landlord and wants to complain about the lack of services of heat and hot water, the tenant comes into the district court and applies for a court order. If there's domestic abuse, if there's a domestic partner that is abusing another partner, that person comes into the district court and asks for a restraining order. Or if there's harassment, 
between non-domestic partners, that uh, that person can come into the district court. If there's a problem with substance or alcohol abuse, so, so, so say someone wants somebody committed because uh, the substance use is is harming themselves mm -hmm. or others, so that person can come into the district court and ask for court order. If someone is is having mental health issues where that person is a danger to himself or to others, that can also come into the district court. If you um, watch TV tonight and someone is arrested for murder, mm -hmm. the first judge that that person will see who's accused of, uh, of a murder will be in the district court. So it is the gateway to justice. Right. Um, so going back to what you said about the landlord and tenant situations, um, in 2015 you had a case regarding a landlord and um, their tenant of Muslim faith that was brought to you. Um, could you tell me more about that? Uh, that was a unique case and, and received some, some publicity um, uh, because of um, the issues that uh, I may uh, have brought up because of uh, a sentencing that mm -hmm. I gave. And, and the background was that the defendant who was, who was accused of a solemn battery on another tenant, um, uh, she was the, uh, the landlord and uh, she was a uh, Nigerian who was a um, ordained minister who had studied at Princeton and studied uh, religion at Harvard. Um, she rented uh, her three-family house, and one of the floors was uh, rented to a, a Muslim woman and her children. And from time to time, um, the defendant, the minister, would uh, poke her uh, head out and yell at them as they were coming into the house that the Muslim religion was wicked, that they would, they would burn in hell, and, and, and the like. On one specific day, uh, the, uh, the minister was accused of uh, pushing or shoving um, the tenant down the flight of stairs. And that's where the song battery okay. came out. Um, the jury heard it. Mm -hmm. The minister testified that she was in her apartment praying. Uh, she was never out on the stairway. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a jury trial, um, the um, jury convicted her. The yeah. jury didn't believe her. Yeah. So the controversy came out was that I, uh, part of my sentence was that I, I required her to um, have an introductory course on Islam. Uh, that I, I felt that she was not respecting the religious beliefs of other people and as a result she was singling this family out mm -hmm. for uh, discriminatory treatment by saying these things and by doing what she did because there was no other reason for her to do what she did and be, being convicted of assault battery. So uh, certain people um, uh, looking at the case said that I was infringing on this minister. So the, the minister was a Christian minister uh, on her freedom of religion. Obviously the freedom of religion is guaranteed by the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. right? Everybody has the freedom of religion. And by me forcing her as part of her probationary term to learn about the Muslim faith, they thought that I was impinging on her religion. Um, she never objected when, when I mm -hmm. uh, sentenced her. And as a result, when they went up to the Supreme Judicial Court, um, the, the highest court in, in Massachusetts, that court said that because she never objected, she waived any objection to that part of my sentence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important to remember, especially in this day and age, um, even if we don't agree with something or we don't, um, we're not a part of it, um, we should still respect it. You know, I certainly learned a lot about religions in um, my previous high school years. No amendment <laughs> was broken. Um, Education is important. Right, I, that's exactly uh, what I thought. Especially when she testified in the witness stand, 
that, you know, she, she's a very learned person. She went mm -hmm. to Princeton, she went to Harvard to, to uh, learn about religion and have, get her uh, theology degree. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought perhaps there was this little piece that may be missing in her education. Right, right. Um, so as we have seen over the past several years with COVID, um, there has definitely been, been an increase in the amount of Asian hate crimes. Um, so what do they tell you about our country? Um, maybe like what we need to work on or? Um, right, that, during that COVID um, um, part, I, I think it was mishandled by the federal government at, at, at the get-go. Um, it didn't have to be framed that it was a uh, Chinese disease. Mm -hmm. uh, as the federal government did, uh, and specifically the former president. Um, and that um, provided um, that permission for people to label it as something that's Asian, that's foreign, that mm -hmm. was endangering the United States. And I think that was the wrong framing uh, of how that disease came about. Uh, uh, you know, these kinds of diseases, uh, communicable diseases and viruses, they come from all over the world. Uh, and in, in this particular instance, it, it, came, it originated from China, but it could come from any part of the world. It didn't need to be framed that mm -hmm. way. Um, so what do you think this says about diversity in our government or representation? Do you feel um, if we had um, more Asian Americans working in this um, environment, we would be able to have stronger representation and stronger voice? Correct. I, I, I definitely agree that, with that. And, and that's the reason uh, I, I want to become a, uh, a judge. I mean, uh, the judiciary is the third branch of government. We have the we have the executive branch, mm -hmm. we have uh, the legis legislative branch, and we have the judiciary. Each of those three branches of our government, right, need Asian voices. And the reason we need a Asian voices is because, you know, our, our, our needs have to be, be met also. You know, there's a changing world. Everything changes from time to time. And as things change, right, there needs to be different solutions to different problems. Mm -hmm. So in the three branches of government, that's how we, we, we make overall change. Um, so Asian voices need to be up in all three branches of government. I agree. Um, so this is a little slightly off topic, but I think this is important to talk about with um, viewers who might not know about this case, but the Murdoch case. Um, I'm wondering, um, well, first, could you maybe summarize it for those who might not know what it is? So I don't have any um, insight and knowledge mm -hmm. on, 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 on this particular case. This case happened in South Carolina, mm -hmm. not in Massachusetts. Right. So what I've, I, I know is what I've, I've seen on, on, on mm -hmm. news media and what I've read in the newspaper. So what, what I understand happened was that uh, Mr. Murdoch, he's a, he's a very uh, prominent uh, civil attorney. Uh, in in that state, his family is very prominent. Um, they have a big law firm. Uh, he was a, 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 I understand he, he did personal injury, and the like. But very, very and his whole family, uh, going back to his grandfather, was a lawyer. And his his grandfather's portrait was in the county courthouse where he was tried. Mm -hmm. And they had to take that down because they didn't want in. Uh, uh, unduly influence a juror as mm -hmm. to the importance of the Murdoch name. So that's how important uh, uh, this family was. So he was accused of, of murdering his, his child, his son, um, adult son, and also his wife. And to this date, the motive is, is unknown. No one saw him do it. So there's no eyewitness to the murder. So the prosecution put pieces of evidence together to lead 
them to believe that he did it. So it was a circumstantial case. So that means these little pieces of information would hopefully convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt that he, he committed both mm -hmm. murders. So it was tried on that theory. It was circumstantial. And in most circumstantial case, in any criminal case, the, the, the prosecution has to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. That's a very high standard, mm -hmm. beyond a reasonable doubt. That means no one can have any reasonable doubt when you think about this case. Mm -hmm. You search their minds, right? Uh, the jury has a binding conviction that he is the one that did it. It's mm -hmm. a very, very high standard. Right. You know, being a former prosecutor, I know how high that standard mm -hmm. is. And also as a judge, I know how high that standard is. So the prosecution put in their case, and after they put in their case, um, in, in most circumstantial cases, the defense usually, they don't put any evidence mm -hmm. in. The reason they don't put in any evidence is, is because it's circumstantial. There's always little pieces of, of the puzzle that are missing. Mm -hmm. If you look at a criminal case, it's like looking at a big puzzle. So there will be p pieces of the puzzle missing because there's no eyewitness. So when a defense puts on a case in a circumstantial case, that could add some of the pieces to the puzzle. And in this particular case, you know, just from my own observation, you know, uh, Mr. Murdoch, the, the, the person who was accused of both well, first, he put in little pieces of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And that enhanced perhaps the jury's understanding of the circumstantial case to lead them to make or arrive at a verdict within three hours. That's a very short mm -hmm. verdict for a very long, long case. You know, in the district mm -hmm. court, I've, or in, I've tried a lot of cases where the jury has been like out for days, mm -hmm. and it's not even a murder case. Mm -hmm. So this was a very quick, uh, very, very quick uh, verdict uh, on a circumstantial case, mm -hmm. too, because, you know, you, everybody, all 12 people have to see the same picture, right. and it has to convince them beyond a reasonable doubt that this is the same picture that he is the one that did it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the observation that, that I came right. from, but that's only an opinion. Right. What do you think this um, extremely quick um, verdict like says about the case? Does it maybe say that the defense team didn't do as well as the prosecution, or what did it seem like? Um, it depends what what they had to work with. I, I don't know the case uh, as well as the defense team, obviously. It depends what they had to work with. If they had um, some, um, more to work with, then perhaps it, you know, they didn't do as well. If they didn't have as much to work with, you know, that's what they, they had to work with. And then it also comes down to you know, every person who is accused of a crime has a right to testify. Right. Every person, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it's whether or not, you know, that person who is accused chooses to testify or not. And if the person doesn't choose to testify, you know, there's, ju there's just no evidence from that person's lips mm -hmm. about what happened. So in this particular case, um, he chose to testify. Mm -hmm. But when he chose to testify, there was also uh, um, some disadvantages. And as you can see in, from the media, he had to admit that he lied on several occasions about his behavior mm -hmm. on, on the case itself because he lied that he wasn't at the kennel. It was at the kennel mm -hmm. where, 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 where both persons perished. And he, he said he wasn't at the kennel to, to the law enforcement when they arrived. Then later on, after they discovered that there was a video uh, that was uh, done by his son just before he died, his voice is on the video uh, a short period before mm -hmm. both uh, the mother and the son died. 
So that puts him into the scene, you know, just before the murder. And it was hard for him to explain that away, you know, from, from what I saw on the news media. And he also had to admit that he took uh, a lot of opiates, he mm -hmm. stole from clients. So when, when someone gets up to testify, I don't, I don't mean that, that, that the jury has to like him, mm -hmm. but it didn't seem as if he was a very likable person. Right. He was a drug addict, he, he cheated uh, on his clients, allegedly, because he, that those charges mm -hmm. are still up uh, to be tried, millions of dollars. He lied about that he was at the scene. Uh, he lied about parts of of, of um, the murder. So it could be that those are the kinds of things that the jury uh, consider uh, when they assess the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Certainly a very riveting criminal case. Um, in your experience, so you have um, represented criminal and civil cases, correct? That's correct. Um, what, what is, or what type of case has really drawn you, has like appealed to you? I think all, all, all cases uh, mm -hmm. draw an, an appeal to me. Um, in, in, in any of these cases, um, it's being able to, 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 to present the best case possible with what you have, right? And whether or not it's a criminal case or, or, or a civil case. And it's, a, a lot of it is art. It's mm -hmm. the art of persuasion, how, how a, a lawyer can persuade a jury uh, to uh, come to see it from that party's viewpoint mm -hmm. and agree that that is the right decision to make uh, in that particular case. So th there is, there re really is, is a, an enjoyment factor um, and, and an art factor to putting the case together, putting it on, and then once you, I, you know, the case is put on, it's out of my hands because yes. the jury has it. Mm -hmm. So that, that part is a, you know, being a trial lawyer, that's the most enjoyable part. So um, it's definitely very, it's, you have a lot of responsibility, but there's, it's very rewarding at the same time. Exactly. Okay. Um, so again, like as a minority race in the judicial system and in the U.S. government, um, do you have any advice that you would give to any younger Asian Americans um, who aspire to um, work in this field or create a more um, widespread and impactful voice? I, I would encourage anybody to think about you know, being a lawyer, to bring, think about uh, public service, uh, public service meaning going to the government, you know, whether or not it's the executive branch work, you know, being involved in an administrative agency, whether or not it's federal or state, because that person will, will have some, uh, some uh, voice or in the executive, right? branch, uh, you know, assisting um, uh, 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 leaders to carry out the law, right? Every law, at some point in time, there's interpretations. There may be some ambiguity, and that's where an Asian voice uh, can be injected to say, perhaps the, re uh, the right interpretation of this uh, law is to this way that would benefit the Asian community. Mm -hmm. And also the judiciary. The judiciary, um, whether or not is a judge or in the clerk's office, or throughout that whole judicial system, uh, Asian voices should, should be there. Because all of us, we all interact with those three branches of government. Uh, and uh, so we need Asian voices within each one of them. I think we're definitely long overdue, but um, I think we're, we're doing better every day. Um, we've had our first black president, um, first black vice president, so 
Those are defi- that's definitely encouraging. Yes. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, do you have any words you'd like to tell our audience? Um, to to um, uh, the Asian audience, uh, please, please consider your civic duty. If you're able to vote, please vote. Please get involved in your government because this is the only way things can change for all of us, for, all, for the betterment of yourself, your family, of the entire community. If we stay silent, our voices will all, we have no voice and we will not be heard. So we always have to be able to vote. If you don't have uh, ability to vote at this time, think about becoming a citizen so you can vote. If you, you are a citizen, please see how you can get connected so into the political process so your voice can be heard. Um, the way I've contributed is a, is a different way as a judge and as a prosecutor. But each of us can contribute in very different ways to enhance our Asian community for the better.